This evening, you're listening to West Musings, 10-minute museums talks, 10-minute museum talks being presented by the Western Museums Association here located at the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City. And thank you so much all for being here. Um, our next speaker is James Pepper Henry. How many people's lives have been touched by James Pepper Henry? Jim, we're all a big fan. Um, he has recently been named the first native director of the Heard Museum in Arizona. Before that, Alaska. Before that, Washington. I could go on and on and on. Perhaps one of the most impressive careers in museums today. Jim, you do a straight tribute by honoring our stage. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Now, how many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Just about everybody, right? Great movie. Um, and of course, it's Indiana Jones. He comes in and at the beginning of the movie and takes the sacred object from the sacred temple and, and, and takes off. Well, I have to tell you, I hate this movie. As a Native American, this epitomizes what museums are about from, from the mid 20th century, that the loot was taken, put in cultural repositories, and I often think that, what if we turn this around? What if the, the native guys went to Turin Cathedral in, in Italy and stole the Shroud of Turin? What do you think the reaction would be? I think there would be a worldwide manhunt for these guys, right? So, um, Indiana Jones has got the loot. What does he do with the loot? A lot of this loot ends up in our museums. And here, at the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark of the Covenant goes into this giant warehouse, and I always assumed this was the Smithsonian, and I worked for the Smithsonian for 10 years, and that's what the Smithsonian looks like. It's a, it's a giant warehouse. And so, uh, one thing, though, uh, as from, from a Native perspective, that many of the objects that were collected, obviously, uh, are very sensitive, very sacred, but if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not indoctrinated into that society and know how to treat a particular item, it can be very dangerous. Look what happened at the end of the movie <laughs> when these guys opened the Ark of the Covenant. So what happens when there are tens of thousands of Arks of the Covenant or Holy Grails in one location? And at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, I think uh, there were many collectors who believed by the end of the 20th century that Native American culture would no longer exist, that there would be no more material culture being produced. And so my experience, my own personal experience, was working with the old High Foundation as it was being absorbed by the Smithsonian Institution in 1989. And just a little bit of background, um, the High Foundation was founded by George Gustav High, and he uh, became obsessed with collecting Native American material. He was the scion of a wealthy uh, railroad magnet, and he took his first trip out to Arizona in 1902 and discovered uh, or uh, had interactions with some Apaches at a railroad station, collected a few items. I think there were uh, some pottery, uh, pottery items and a few blankets, and then spent the rest of his life obsessed with collecting as much material culture as possible. And through the course of his life, he, he married a very wealthy woman, uh, spent all of her money, divorced her, <laughs> married another wealthy woman, and she outlived him uh, eventually on that one. But uh, so by the end of his life in the 1950s, he, he amassed the largest private collection of American Indian material in the world. And he built a museum on 155th and Broadway and that museum existed up until the 1980s, the late 1980s. And uh, after he passed away, he set up an endowment to fund the museum. But over time, uh, that fund started to lose money. And it got to a critical point back in the mid-1980s. And if you all you remember Ross Perot, the short little guy from Texas who ran for president? Um, well, Ross Perot uh, offered to buy this collection uh, for about $270 million, and I think at the time it was appraised at close to a billion dollars, so uh, pennies on the dollar. And people were concerned that if this was sold, um, it would be piecemealed out and, and bits and pieces of it would be sold all over the world, and this was such an important collection that it got the attention of Congress. It's a long story, but Congress in 1989 passed the National Museum of the American Indian Act to absorb the high collection, and with that, um, there, there were a series of um, efforts to bring in Native Americans to work in museums, and I was in that first batch 
uh, of young Native Americans to work at the Smithsonian with the high collection as it was being absorbed by the Smithsonian Institution. So um, here I was, this, this young buck, working with uh, museum, other museum professionals, uh, professionally trained museum conservators and collections managers and registrars. And we were trying to figure out what to do with this collection, how we would manage it in a different way because the way these collections had been managed in the past, they were items were stacked on top of each other. There were stories, uh, I heard stories of George High, he would have lavish parties in his museum and he would invite his guests to, to pick the items from the collection that they would wear at the dinner table. He would bring out Maria Martinez pottery and that people would eat off the pottery. And uh, so, uh, very different perspective coming in and having Native peoples involved in the management of these collections. And some of the practices that we came up with are commonplace today, but they weren't commonplace 20 years ago. So we sat down and we thought about this and consulted with Native peoples from not only the United States, but from around the world. And uh, as we were consulting with them, we came up with a design for a new storage facility in Suitland, Maryland to house this collection. And let's see if I have a slide here of some of our consultations. And so we talked about this. Some of the museum practices that were in place at the time were not compatible with the beliefs of our native constituencies. And it was important to us to open up our doors to uh, our native constituents so that they would have access to the collections and have a say in how we manage the collections. And this was a very new concept. I know my grandparents' generation, they weren't even allowed to go into the museum, much less go into the collections area. So, um, so we sat around and we talked about this. We tried to understand some of the items that we had in the collection. We had human remains. We had tens of thousands of funerary objects. We had thousands of sacred objects and thousands of objects of cultural patrimony. And what we learned, and, uh, and even from my own experience, is that many of these objects were considered to be alive, to have a life force power, that they needed to be treated as a living entity. And the way the museum practices were, they were being poisoned with arsenic, uh, cyanide gas, DDT, uh, naphthalene, and they were being stored in such a way where they couldn't breathe in plastic bags and sealed containers, um, and not, not, not visited like they would be as, as if they were living beings. So uh, it was a challenge for us to find that balance between native perspectives of caring for collections and the way institutions care for collections. And so we spent a heck of a lot of time uh, designing this facility and, and trying to figure out our protocols. And uh, a lot of times, my, again, my own experience, being a native person working in a museum, our native constituents were automatically drawn to the native staff and, uh, and kind of putting the burden upon us to care for these objects from their own tribes, even though that we weren't uh, indoctrinated or have the authority to care for these items. I didn't even have the authority for my own tribe to, 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 you know, to care for, for some of those objects. So, um, so we thought about this and we tried to find a compromise because we have to realize that everything in the museum was taken away from its cultural context. Our job was to bring that context back to the collections. And so, uh, one of the things that we uh, that was commonplace among many of the tribes is that items that were considered living or having a living spirit, uh, the spirits would move in and out of that particular object, and it wasn't a good idea to have those spirits interfere with the living. And so, as we designed the storage facility, we uh, developed 12-foot uh, storage bays where we could store the more sensitive items where we wouldn't inadvertently come across them, and the spirits could move in and out unabated. Uh, also. Uh, it's, it was pretty commonplace for most museums to store items by item type rather than by culture. And, and, and uh, by trying to store items by culture, it took up a lot more room. We needed more square footage to be able to store everything. But you know, all the blankets of all the different tribes were stored together, all the pots for all the different tribes were stored together in the past. But we consolidated these so that it made it much a much better experience for our native constituents. As they came to the museum, they could find the items that they were looking for in one place. Also, um, we had gender restrictions. And of course, working in a federal facility, there are, there are rules against gender discrimination. We had uh, female puberty ceremony rights. We had war bundles. We had um, other items that either a, a specific gender should only handle or somebody of a specific age can handle. And of course, 
um, we couldn't put those restrictions on our own staff, but we asked staff to uh, voluntarily abide by the wishes of the native, uh, our native constituents. And so here's an example of a puberty uh, right headdress from one of the tribes in Arizona. And the tribe uh, that we worked with requested that males never look upon this item uh, directly, but it was okay to put an image of the item on a closed container and only women would handle that container. And so we, we accommodated that particular tribe and we have hundreds of, of examples of just that, um, of that sensitivity. And also going back to the fact that some of these objects are living entities needed to breathe before these objects were stored in sealed, sealed containers in case there was a fire or water, uh, it would prevent the, uh, the item from being damaged. But we redesigned the cases and put muslin covers on the front so air could flow in and out so the objects could breathe. And here's another example. Um, they asked us to store pipes with the, with the bowls uh, uh, disassembled from the stem. If you attach that together, it, it means that the ceremony is taking place. And so we wanted to be respectful of that. And we had thousands of pipes in the collection. And here's an example of an item that needed to be fed, looked upon as a living being, and that uh, the tribal members would come in and bring food offerings to an item. And as you know, if you work in collections management, that can attract pests. And so we had an integrated pest management system where we monitored the pests, but we allowed for food offerings in the collection, which is against most, uh, uh, most protocols in museums. And of course, we, um, we were always happy to host tribes to come in to do research. We had special rooms within uh, the facility uh, that were closed off from the rest of the, uh, the museum where people could come in and look at items and have some privacy. And it was always a joy to work with tribes that had not seen these objects in three or four generations and, uh, and to return the favor of uh, to them, and almost like being a time capsule so that they can learn more about their own cultural patrimony. And a lot of this, this, is, this could be an all-day seminar. Uh, we go into a lot of detail, but we chronicled a lot of what we did and how we came about some of these protocols in a book called Stewards of the Sacred. It was produced by AAM and Harvard University, and I think it's still available, but uh, there are several essays in there. I've contributed an essay to it. So if you want to learn more about sensitive collections management, uh, please pick up a copy of that. So thank you very much.